Espera. Hay algo. Tienes razón. Tráeme el padre. History is a gift of knowledge handed down to us by generations past. This knowledge is far more than a collection of facts arranged in chronological order. It's a source of enlightenment that helps us understand ourselves and our place, our purpose in our world and in the universe around us. The progress of research in history, archaeology, ancient languages, and anthropology has yielded information that has been hidden for many centuries. And this provides us with important new insights into the meaning of our lives. It's natural to start a story at the beginning, but in the case of our own story, that's, uh, that's more easily said than done. How can we discover the origins of our own experiences? Where or when was our beginning? The ancient Babylonians left us one of the oldest myths about human origins. It's an epic creation poem that was written sometime during the second millennium BC. It's called the Enuma Elish, which translated means when on high. When on high the heaven had not been named, firm ground below had not been called by name, not but primordial Apsu their begetter, and Mumu Tiamat, she who bore them all, their waters commingling as a single body. According to the experts, the ancient Babylonians believed that Apsu represents sweet water and Tiamat salt water. At the beginning of creation, the two had not yet been separated mingled together as they were, they possessed within them the seeds of life. They brought forth generations of gods who in the course of time created man. The Navajo and Pueblo Indians of North America share a traditional view of several separate creations. The Aztecs of old Mexico had a similar belief. The god Quetzalcoatl invented people, molding them from ash. A great flood came, and all the people became fish. The Creator tried again, but there was a complete eclipse of the sun, and in the darkness, all the people were killed and eaten by jaguars. A rain of volcanic fire and ash destroyed the third creation. The fourth attempt was foiled when the world was ravaged by a violent hurricane, and people turned into apes. The earth as we know it is the result of the fifth creation and is doomed to ultimate destruction by earthquake and famine. Not a very reassuring picture, is it? And yet this worldview was very real to the Aztecs. This is all depicted in the famous sunstone, perhaps the single most important artifact from the Aztec civilization. Created in the 15th century, it weighs in at over 25 tons. Very substantial evidence of their view of beginnings. It's all there, carved in stone. But does it accurately portray our beginnings? Best-selling Swiss writer Eric von Däniken has 16 books to his credit. Nothing else he has written has had the phenomenal impact of his 1968 book, Chariots of the Gods, in which he proposed a novel view of human development here on Earth. Dim as yet undefinable ages ago, an unknown spaceship discovered our planet. The crew of the spaceship soon found out that the Earth had all the prerequisites for intelligent life to develop. Obviously, the man of those times was no Homo sapiens, but something rather different. The spacemen artificially fertilized some female members of this species, 
put them into a deep sleep, so the ancients say, and departed. Thousands of years later, the space travelers returned. They repeated their breeding experiment several times, until finally they produced a creature intelligent enough to have the rules of society imparted to it. The Bible and the Quran are the basis for the traditional Judeo-Christian and Islamic teachings about our beginnings. Both point to a creator from outside the bounds of space and time. They picture an all-powerful being who is above and beyond the natural laws that govern our physical universe. They teach that this creator God exercised his supernatural power and created everything according to his divine purpose. The Bible includes this summary reference to the creation. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Quran, holy book of Islam, shares the basic biblical view of creation this way. Lo, your Lord is Allah, who created the heavens and the earth in six days, then mounted he the throne. He covereth the night with the day, which is in haste to follow it, and hath made the sun and the moon and the stars subservient by his command. His verily is all creation and commandment. Blessed be Allah, the Lord of the worlds. By the early 1800s, some scientists were proposing new theories regarding the origin of life on Earth, theories that conflicted with traditional creationism. In December of 1831, the HMS Beagle set sail from England on a five-year round-the-world voyage. Aboard this survey ship as an unpaid naturalist was 22-year-old Charles Darwin. Darwin's observations and conclusions would revolutionize the conventional view of origins. Their idea was that God had created specifically for each environment the animals and plants that fit into it. Well, if that was true, then one oceanic island ought to resemble another oceanic island. And what Darwin found was that the, the oceanic islands didn't look anything alike. The species that were on the oceanic islands were similar to the nearest continent, not to other oceanic islands. Darwin's most significant discoveries took place in the Galapagos Islands, more than 1,000 kilometers, about 600 miles, off the west coast of Ecuador. Darwin discovered animal species that were unique to that archipelago. He also noted distinct variations between similar animals on different islands. He came back one day having picked up a tortoise shell from the island that he had been visiting. And the fellow who lived there and was staying at the, at the uh, main uh, population center said, oh, you've been to and named the island he'd been to. And he was floored. He said, how do you know where I've been? And he says, because that tortoise came from the island. And he says, how do you know that? And he said, because each island has a, a specially shaped tortoise and I can recognize them. And that just blew his socks off. Darwin's observations ultimately led to the development of his theory of natural selection and the publication in 1859 of his book on the origin of species. The first edition was sold out the first day, and five subsequent editions with revisions were to follow. Often referred to as the book that shook the world, it helped pioneer modern scientific thought about our origins. Today, science is defined at the beginning as a materialistic process. Um, and that's a tribute to Darwinism. I mean, that's what he brought to us was that uh, we had escaped, essentially, from, from God. Using Darwin's theories of evolution as a starting point, scientists and philosophers have developed their own answers to questions about beginnings. Today, there are many variations on Darwin's theme. Among evolutionary scientists, the Big Bang theory has been widely accepted as a beginning point for the story of our universe as we know it. This theory suggests that all the matter that now exists in the universe 
is derived from a tightly compressed, incredibly hot mass of subatomic particles that exploded something like 10 or 15 billion years ago. That tremendous blast of creative energy set the universe in motion and eventually gave birth to galaxies and stars and planets, and ultimately to every form of life and matter within the universe. The way scientists today talk about this, the Big Bang really is the whole universe, and that it is really space itself which is expanding and creating new space in the course of time. If we think of ourselves uh, in a way as kind of being able to look at the universe from some extra dimension, it perhaps would appear as a the tremendous explosion starting out from a single point. The theory of evolution teaches that life on Earth has evolved over vast periods of time with simple single-celled forms developing into complex organisms purely by blind chance through a process of trial and error. It was this process that Charles Darwin called natural selection. And he said essentially that there were four steps. He said, first of all, uh, variation exists. No two individuals in a population are ever exactly alike. Secondly, that every population overproduces. More young come into existence in one year than can possibly live until the next year. So that leads to the struggle for existence, the competition, and then survival of the ones that are the fittest. The fittest are simply those that have variations that give them an advantage. And the last thing was that the, the, the variations are inherited so that the ones that live reproduce and their offspring are more likely to have these fit variations. Are we the unplanned and accidental result of evolution through natural selection? Or are we the handiwork of a supreme being, the Allah of the Quran and the God of the Bible? Do we owe our existence to the Aztec or Babylonian gods or to some alien creatures from outer space? What is the truth about our origin? Today, the theory of evolution is presented to school children and promoted in the media as if it were proven fact. The truth of the matter is, however, the theory of evolution is just that, a theory. Its scientific foundations are actually kind of shaky. Molecular biologist and author Michael Denton gives us this insight into Charles Darwin and his theory. The popular conception of a triumphant Darwin increasingly confident after 1859 in his views of evolution is a travesty. On the contrary, by the time the last edition of The Origin was published in 1872, he had become plagued with self-doubt and frustrated by his inability to meet the many objections which had been leveled at his theory. Darwin's theory of natural selection could not be thoroughly tested in his day due to the limitations of the scientific equipment available at that time. Today's scientists were able to study the complicated systems within even the simplest single cell organisms. Many people think of single cells as being less complex than multicellular organisms. Um, Darwin thought so, and he thought that the first organism was a cell. Um, Darwin can be excused for thinking so because the equipment to look inside the cell and see what was going on just didn't exist then. Now that we have it, we look inside the cell and we find uh, enormous complexity. Um, amoebas move like we move. They don't have muscles, they have microfilaments. Um, we digest our food. Um, we do respiration. But so does the amoeba. They're much smaller than we are. They don't have but one cell, but they do all of the things we do and they're just as complex. The complexity of even the simplest life forms is one of the reasons why many scientists are becoming increasingly dissatisfied with the evolutionary explanation with its reliance upon pure unguided chance. Now, there's good reason for scientists to question the power of chance. Take a look at this simple demonstration. You see what I mean? Now, here are three blocks, numbered one, two, three. There are six possible combinations of these three numbers. Now, I'll put the blocks into this box. 
and shake it up. Now, if I were to take out the blocks one at a time, what are my chances of taking them out in numerical order? Well, I can expect to draw out the numbers one, two, and three in that order on an average of once in every six attempts. Now, here are two more blocks, numbered four and five. I'll add them to the three others in the box. Now, there are 120 possible combinations. The law of averages tells me that I can expect to pull out blocks numbered one, two, three, four, and five in that order on the average of once in every 120 tries. Now, look, here are blocks numbered six through 10. I'll put them in the box for the others. Now, my chance of picking out all 10 blocks in numerical order is less than one in three and one half million. <laughs> well, let me put that in perspective. If I put myself on a schedule and worked at this game day and night, pulling out all 10 blocks one at a time every 15 seconds, I could expect to win this game on the average of about once every 18 months. What if I doubled my quantity of sequentially numbered blocks to 20? How long should I expect to work at this game to get all 20 out of the box in order? Now, let's suppose that I could play at blinding speed and get all 20 blocks out in just one second, then do it again the next second and every second thereafter. Now, the law of averages says that I could expect to get the 20 blocks out of the box in order at the rate of once every 77 billion years. This little numbers game is nothing compared to the intricate complexity of even the simplest bits of matter. Physiologist and author Pierre Le Contenui, in his book, Human Destiny, estimated the chance of forming a 2,000 atom protein molecule as something like one in 10 to the 321st power. There's really no good way to express that number. It's uh, incomprehensible. Find yourself a large sheet of paper. Write 10 followed by 320 zeros. <laughs> now listen to what Lecomte de Nuit says. Events which need an infinitely longer time than the estimated duration of the Earth in order to have one chance on the average to manifest themselves can, it would seem, be considered as impossible in the human sense. This chunk of coal is about 70% carbon by volume. Carbon is essential to all organic life, and it's the fourth most common element in the universe. Yet this very ordinary element is extremely complex. In order for it to be produced naturally, three helium nuclei must combine to form a single carbon nucleus. But we have found that the conditions needed for that to happen are really very precise. In other words, that if the balance of forces in the atomic nucleus were very slightly different, that that reaction would not be able to take place in order to form enough carbon to be of any significance. Men who discovered this, the way in which this reaction takes place to, to form carbon and who found the conditions that were necessary for it to take place uh, was Fred Hoyle, who is one of the great astrophysicists and cosmologists of this century. Uh, Hoyle was very skeptical about religion, at the time at least, he was an atheist. Some supercalculating intellect must have designed the properties of the carbon atom. Otherwise, the chance of my finding such an atom through the blind forces of nature would be utterly minuscule. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. It seems that evolution through a long series of random unguided mutations is a practical impossibility. This fact 
casts a cloud of doubt over the entire evolutionary scenario. Scientists are now looking for shortcuts, miraculous jumps out of the realm of chance. Many are frankly awed by their discoveries, finding more and more clear evidence of intelligent design in nature. Intelligent design, of course, requires a designer. And the clearest portrayal of a designer and his work is found here in the Bible. The creation account itself records a systematic progression of creative acts culminating in the creation of man. The Hebrew prophet Jeremiah emphasizes this intelligent design when he writes about the creator. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Biblical creation theology does not attempt to provide a scientific description of God's creative acts. Instead, it suggests the meaning, the purpose, the goal of creation. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. I think the most important thing about this verse, as far as our understanding of creation is concerned, is that seeing the universe as creation is a matter of faith rather than of scientific knowledge. That is, that we can understand the universe in detail uh, by scientific investigation but we see it as the creation of God because of our personal trust and confidence in God. Now, perhaps some of us have been too quick to discard this old book as an irrelevant collection of useless fables and legends and traditions. Its value lies far beyond the realm of science. It deals with concepts that cannot be analyzed in a laboratory. It addresses many questions that science cannot answer. That is, science can talk about how the universe behaves, how things take place within the universe. It cannot explain why something exists rather than nothing. That is, it cannot really explain the fundamental question of existence. Could it be that the neglected pages of scripture actually offer accurate insights into our origins? If so, <laughs> we're not here by accident. We must see ourselves as a part of a creator's design. There must be a plan, some real purpose for our existence. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. The creation story depicts God as having great ambitions, high hopes for the human race. People were created in the image of their maker. In their original innocence, they had direct communication with God an intimate, personal, face-to-face -face relationship with their creator. 